one of the uh, one of the guys I spoke to, uh, a guy called Jim, Jim Toms, wonderful man. You know, he t- he said something that really struck with me, and that is the, the soul of the British Army was in Germany, for, certainly for 45 years in the Cold War, and for 75 years to now. I think that's yeah. that's absolutely spot on. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. So, an extraordinary night of euphoria in Berlin. Within hours of East Germany's decision to let its people go by opening the border to the West, the city erupted in a frenzy of celebration. East German border guards watched as jubilant crowds danced on the infamous Berlin Wall that's divided Europe for a generation. Astonishing news from East Germany, where the East German authorities have said, in essence, that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. But tonight, there were no filters, no checks. At midnight, the border was thrown open and the crowd surged through the open gates. We want to like to have the experience to go this way and we want to go back to our country. You don't want to stay in the West? No, never. This is not a normal night. There is astonishing news from East Germany. We are witnessing the end of an era. After 28 years, the East German government is throwing open its borders to the West, turning the Berlin Wall into a relic of the Cold War and possibly opening a whole new page in European history. Dr. Peter Johnston is the head of Collections Research and Academic Access at the National Army Museum in London. He is also the author of a lavishly illustrated military and social history of the forces in Germany during the Cold War. Now, if you like the podcast, you can help us by supporting us for the price of a couple of coffees a month. You'll be helping cover the show's increasing costs and keep us on the air. Plus, you get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster too. Just head to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more information. So back to today's episode, James speaks with Peter, who provides some great accounts of the experiences of British soldiers in Germany. We welcome Peter to our Cold War conversation. So this book, um, what was the genesis of it? Why did you decide to write it? So I think my my passion for the for the subject and the, the history of the British Army has been long standing. But the way I actually came to to write this book, to start it and get involved, began two and a half years ago. I think when I was reading the news, I was following what was happening online as part of my role here at the museum, and I was seeing the army bases closing in Germany, and I and I was thinking, well, what's happening to all that history? You know, the army's been this there this, this huge amount of time and. What is actually happening to this history? You know, being a being a historian, but also being a museum curator, I enjoy the material culture as much as I enjoy pouring through documents. You know, the the, the physical stuff. Yeah. And and that's what we fill museums with, and that's what we build stories around. And so I was looking at this, thinking, well, what are they actually doing with all this, all this, all these things? You know, and and so I reached out. I, re- I reached out to, to um, the historical branch within the army uh, and some various contacts, um, but it wasn't until I, I quite I quite literally bumped into the uh, commander of British Forces Germany, Brigadier uh, Ian Bell, in Aldershot on a on a completely separate visit down to down to home command, and I started talking to him about it, and he said, "Oh, well, that's really interesting because we're looking at getting involved in this kind of in this legacy project as well," and so he introduced me to his legacy team, which is been led by and really driven by 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 the legacy officer without whom none of this would have been wouldn't have been possible and from there we just built this this process and for me it was about accumulating and preserving and saving this history the early mantra we had was exhibit it don't skip it when they were closing out these bases as, as part of the army 2020 plans but that evolved into then come around to this passion realizing that, that you know they wanted a book written i wanted to write a book and they asked me if I would write the book for them. And so the result is this, the, the authorised history of the British forces in Germany. And it's, it's something I feel immensely privileged to have been able to do because I've loved and lived this subject for, for, for so long. Um, and I, in a way, I almost wish I'd had much longer to do it because it, it, the story is so rich and it's in touch so many people's lives. Um, it, it's been a real joy to be, able to, to be able to tell it. So do I take it that you've been out to Germany to go and raid uh, barracks, officers' messes to find 
the materials that are now going to be exhibited because there's an exhibit coming here at the museum, isn't there, uh, next year? Next year, in, in May 2020, we'll be opening our, our exhibition, which will really look at the, the legacy of the Second World War and everything that comes afterwards. You know, the, the British Army of the Rhine, the, the second British Army of the Rhine, having been the, the previous iteration of 1919 to, to 29, uh, is going to be looking at, you know, how the army basically won the peace. You know, Montgomery said, that, you know, that Montgomery predicted the British Army of the Rhine would be there for 50 years. Uh, and in the end, it's been there for 75. So, you know, I guess a 50% creep over is not too much when it comes to, when it comes to military projects. But I've absolutely been spending my time going out to Germany, communicating with people, and it's been preserving the, that material culture out there, you know, popping my head around barrack doors, bothering quartermasters, picking up amazing things. Um, one of the most amazing things I found on my, on actually one of my most recent trips, uh, was a, Mission, uh, uh, a mission restriction sign. So we're very familiar with mission restriction signs. They were the things put up for Bricksmith. Your, your, your listeners would be very familiar with with those guys saying where they Bricksmith guys couldn't go. But obviously there were ones for Socksmiths as well within the British zone, within the zone. And there were very few of them ever made. Um, and there were very few of them ever kept. And a lot of them were destroyed. But I found one. I found one on a wall in a back room in Fantastic. the transport support unit of uh, of the guys in, in Catterick Barracks in Bielefeld, of whom I'm, um, I'm immensely grateful for all of their kind support and hospitality over my many trips. And I was able to bring that back. And actually, my last trip, I um, I took a van over and I absolutely packed it to the, the absolute gunnels, that thing, uh, and, and drove that back over. Uh, and, and even then, I'm... I'm sad I might not have been able to save everything. Um, I think there's things that might have slipped through my fingers despite all the best efforts. But what I've tried to do is, is marry up some, some, some really, really fun, and enjoyable field collecting with a lot of archival research here in the UK and in particular research with people that, that lived this experience. That's the title of the book, the lived experience. And that's very much what I've tried to do. I've tried to tell the stories and give voice to the, the millions of, of, of people that serve there. You know, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's one unified experience of the British Army's time in Germany, but there's so many wonderful salient points from across the decades, across the history. And that's really what I've tried to bring out in the book. But, and it's very interesting to see the trans, transition of the army from an army of occupation and conquest into an ally and protector, from an am, army of war to national service to a professional peacetime army. And the enemy going from being the Germans to the Soviets, or rather the threat being with the Germans to the Soviets. So I guess the army had to adjust itself and the, the people's experience of it changed as it went through that transition. Immense, immensely. And what, what was fascinating throughout this whole process was that transition the army took on with, and that relationship between the army and Germany, where it moves from foe to friend. Yes. You know, it arrives in, in, you know, this is no easy parade that the army makes, you know, the, the, the battles, the battles west of the, west of the Rhine in early 1945, getting across the Rhine in March 1945, and then driving up from there, the discovery of Belsen in April 45, the advance on the, the various different towns fighting through Osnabrück, which is virtually leveled. Um, you know, all of these places, you know, this is, this was a, this was a war fighting army. This is what this was. It was a highly honed, effective fighting machine and, and a war, and an army that had been at war for, you know, six years by this stage. And there's this amazing period where the war ends and then the army is obviously goes, goes firm and goes situ. But there's all this recollection of everything that happened before or after the First World War. And after the First World War, you know, the British army had never really been encamped so deep into Germany as, as, as it was in 1945. The level of destruction it had wrought on Germany was nowhere near as complete either. Um, um, and what you have, um, uh, uh, and what I've, I've brought out in the book from the testimony of the people who were there, was actually you have this strange feeling where the, 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 the Germans have been the enemy. And the Germans have been the enemy for a long time. Uh, and yet there's this enormous amount of pity for what's happened to them. You know, the, 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 the soldiers see the, the, see the places, they see the destruction that's been wrought by the fighting, by the aerial bombardment. Uh, and they know and they recognize that on a human level. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, they've also encountered things like Belsen. Uh, and they've heard about Belsen. It's been communicated in the newspapers. And there's this real quasi feeling about, well, well, not only what next, but, but what do we do with these people? And then you see the army, and just as you say, it moves from from from, from war fighting to 
to occupation, but also then becomes a, this legal force, this governor, they, where it establishes what the legal norms are for for the Germans. You know, this, the, the the first the first trial, if you will, and Nuremberg's the most famous trial, but the first trial is for the current commandant of Belsen and the, and, and the guards and the staff there. Um, it's the first time that you know video evidence is used and this sort of thing. So it's sort of pioneering things that take place. Uh, as the army moves into this incredibly complex role that, to be honest, lots of people weren't really trained for. You know, the, they were very effective riflemen. They were good mortar teams, machine gun teams, tank crews. You know, and then they, they suddenly it's, it's stop. How quickly did those people who'd fought their way into Germany get replaced by younger people or people who the, the, the national service people who then served their time and were perhaps more administrators than fighters it's it's a quite a slow process actually you know the demobilization is a very slow process uh and in it, it, it takes a long time for the the british army to figure out just what how large its commitment is going to be in germany in the aftermath of the war it recognizes that they have to help rebuild it um, and they want to help rebuild it, but they also understand that they need to sort of keep an eye on the Germans as well because of the, you know, Montgomery had served in the first British Army of the Rhine. He'd seen what what that had been, and he and he had very strong beliefs about the failures of that and what had led to the the, the, the rise of Hitler. And your book brings it out very clearly that Montgomery was quite uh, was was heavily influenced by what had happened in the twenties, and that he wasn't going to let the same thing happen again. Uh, in 45. No, for him it was about winning the peace. It was about winning the peace. Um, and that necessitated a large troop commitment to um, both with the organizational ability to engage in large scale infrastructure projects that were necessary to rebuild Germany, but also to maintain a security operation. There was a latent fear for a long time about this idea of werewolves, for example, the, yeah. these hidden sort of SS units that are going to spring up and wage some kind of guerrilla campaign. Uh, against the occupying forces, it doesn't it never manifests itself at all, um, and I think that does take them by surprise. But you know, Churchill stands up in in, in Parliament in 1945 and is talking about having a million British soldiers in Germany, um, particularly then, because obviously in the after, bubbling alongside all of this is what's happening in, in, in across the uh, across sort of the imaginary borders that have been drawn up when as Germany's been carved up between the occupying powers. There's suddenly this awareness about the, the Soviet Union. Now that the Germans have been defeated, these these fundamental ideological issues that divide the Soviets from the, the other victorious powers, they come back to the surface and suddenly it becomes quite apparent that there are quite expansionist aims and there is a desire to obviously work with them, but there are very competing ideologies at play here. And there's a real fear suddenly about what the Soviets have become, definitely. You know, this is not necessarily purely a a, a po point of political difference, but it's a recognition that this is a very powerful enemy uh, and one that will certainly exploit any weakness. And so that, of course, influences how the British demobilise because suddenly they, they don't want to remove all, all these excellent fighting men. Should there be another conflict, you, you know, they don't want to re remove their experienced soldiers and replace them with inexperienced recruits fresh out of training. Uh, yet at the same time, there's obviously this huge agitation amongst those soldiers. There's the big election, obviously, that takes place, the khaki election that sweeps to power the Labour government, and this idea that people have done enough and want to demob. So balancing these competing domestic pressures, internal pressures, while also looking externally. It's something that the army's really forced to do, and it's something that certainly occupies Montgomery's time. Uh, Sholto Douglas, who comes in afterwards, is very much concerned with this as well. And it really ramps up into the 50s with someone like Gale too. And you mentioned um, that the army loses its collective memory or its corporate memory about how to fight large-scale battles as it uh, fights to win the peace and to subdue the population and to put in law and order, it forgets, as the Soviet threat builds, how to actually go out there and fight on the, on the northern plains of Germany. And it has to relearn those skills through a series of quite large exercises. Absolutely, and that's when you see these, these big exercises taking place, the type of exercises that are really going to characterise life in Germany uh, for the next 75 years, actually. And, and Germany becomes the British Army's training ground, the place where it can actually put together huge operations because it's got the men there and it's got the kit. 
uh, and it's got a effectively a compliant population who can <laughs> simply can't complain as much <laughs> as, as as the good people of Salisbury Plain might. Yes. Uh, and all of this gets put into place, and you have things like exercise agility, which is very early on, brown jug, things that are designed to to build up this training. Particularly going back to your your previous question about as national servicemen are flooded into this environment. Uh, you know, bringing them up to skill and bringing them up to speed quickly becomes something. Uh, and alongside of this, of course, what you've got is this, is this, this, this burgeoning British cultural scene because you've got Operation Union that's taken effect, which has brought all the people's families over. Uh, when was that? So that's really early on. I mean, we're talking soon after the end of the war. By, by 1950s, you've got you know, more than half a million people have been moved across into, into taking up residence. That must change the nature of the experience that your average soldier would have had if his family's there in country with him compared to arriving you know, on the back of a, a jeep and fighting his way through. And you know, the point that it becomes a home posting must mean that really then the army's in for a very long stay. Absolutely. And I think significantly as well, it, it characterises people's relationships to their surroundings because it helps people understand and appreciate that actually what they are is they are a forward shield. Yes, and it's about maintaining uh, an aggressive edge as deterrence because you are going to be fighting for your family and loved ones, either because either your family and loved ones are, are serving with you and living in, in the, in, on the patch in, in initially requisitioned housing that's taken directly from the Germans um, or in specifically built housing as, as, as the decades wear on or because they're, they're back in the UK. But it, it, has, it has this extra do- domesticity to this that really then creates these unique British islands in the German sea uh, around the bases and the areas between them become as I say become the training ground the playground in many ways for the British to to explore and experiment with 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 tactics and doctrine uh, and new technology and that, that must be the majority of the experience that people had was you know quite a domestic experience on the one hand and then quite a as you say large-scale exercises on the other because that must have existed since the mid-50s all the way through to 1989. Definitely. And actually, um, and, um, and what's amazing is, is, is how quickly the social life, as well as the cultural life of the British Army in Germany, begins to subconsciously reflect, mimic, emulate that which the British Army had had in places like India. You know, where the army had gone... Mm. and had a very firm base for a long time, but done really serious soldiering at the same time. Yes. Where it was both professionally extremely rewarding, and yet there was this very rich social scene that replicated British life, but not in Britain. Which must have led to a certain degree of eccentricity amongst some of the officers, one would imagine. Oh, certainly. And many of the people I spoke to reflect on that. And I think it was tolerated because that eccentricity was something that I think life at the sharp end necessitated particularly when you enter the 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 nuclear component um john kisley speaks about john kisley who i interviewed who um held command positions right the way through both during and after the cold war in germany he talks about this you know he says that that this level of eccentricity was produced by sort of the looming nuclear threat you mean you knew that you were gonna you were gonna fight uh and you were probably gonna die and in fact i've got a i've got a a, a quote from him which i think is, is is really beneficial Let's listen to that. I think there was, a, there was also a feeling, knowing the strength of the Soviet army, that um, one's chances of coming out of it unscathed were rather low. That, yes, at that stage, um, the, the, the you know, nuclear deterrence theories of a tripwire that... Um, you know, at some stage, the battle would go nuclear, but um, there wasn't a great deal of thought about how you and your um, NBC nuclear biological chemical suit and your gas mask, your respirator, would be surviving in the event of nuclear weapons being thrown around the battlefield. And I think um, a feeling that um, no, we if this does happen. Uh, our job is to die gloriously. Um, and that in itself produced quite a happy-go-lucky, um, fatalistic um, uh, mindset 
that encouraged sort of eccentricities, encouraged maybe behaviour that would be thought rather odd uh, nowadays, and I suppose encouraged officers of style who had the leadership qualities to hold their command of whatever size together by their leadership and personality. Because if you dwelt too much on the realities of what might face you, um, you might not have the cohesion to actually stand and fight. And I think there was a huge determination, certainly in uh, our battalion, and I'm sure in others as well, that you damn well were going to stand and fight. And if that was the end of you in the battalion, then so be it. Which nowadays sounds incredibly sort of fatalistic, doesn't it? And that's certainly something when you wrote about the Berlin Brigade, I found fascinating that they thought that the likelihood was low, but had it happened, the probability of dying was high. And, you know, they would crash out of their barracks and go and uh, do what they had trained to do. But in all likelihood, it would have been over very, very quickly. And they were there as the forward tripwire. And when you contrast that with the fact that they would put on their full mess dress and go over to the east to go to the opera, that they would walk into the restaurant in East Berlin and they would strike up with God Save the Queen. I love the sort of the contrast of one minute death, the next minute, you know, slightly eccentricity madness uh, in East Berlin. Yeah, you know, if I think if I had one great regret, one thing I'd love to change throughout this whole period I've been writing this book is that I could actually time travel. Yes. And it's like I could actually go back yes. uh, and be part of that and be one of those visits across the wall into East Berlin just to see what it was like. Mm. Because Berlin is just this utterly unique experience for the British Army. Um, yes, it's done frontier soldiering. Yes, it's done, you know, it's been out there in the wilds and people holding things together by the sheer, sheer, sheer strength of will and that sort of thing. But this incredibly civilized way in which they they've they've taken part in 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 in, in, in this lifestyle uh is is, is unbelievable and you, you 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 summed up so so well there you know it's 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 being there as a as a statement of intent you know you will defend western liberal values and you will do it in 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 west berlin despite the fact you're cut off and despite the fact you're miles from from help and you know you might you know that there's the live oak rescue plan in theory but it's never going to work but then at the same time you can have a bloody good time when you're there yes. <laughs> and yes. you can have a huge amount of fun uh and you can you know you you can exploit the 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 the, 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 the very beneficial rate of exchange you can enjoy all these wonderful cultural opportunities that a thriving metropolis offers you and it's this strange i guess it's this strange sense of civility that, you know, just because you're at war with someone doesn't mean you can't be civil. And that's what your book really pulls out. It's the lost world of that system that's gone. The British military train, the fact you wore dress uniform to go to, over the, the inner German border. I know exactly what you mean about time travel. It'd be nice to go and do everything once just to see what it was really like. Um, and none of the madness, I think, is better exemplified than the guarding of Hess, where, you know, an armed soldier every whatever, however, feet, doctors of every nation there, all for one man. And those legacies and those tales of history seem to go on for a long, long time. Yeah, and it's, it's remarkable that for so, for so much of, of, of Berlin's life, and I look at this through the book and I write about the different decades, yet so much of it remains the same. Yeah. And I think that Berlin in particular is almost stuck in this time warp where... Obviously, the victorious allies have got there in 1945. They've carved it up into their respective zones of influence. And they are going to make sure that they're going to maintain and control those. And they agree all these principles about how they're going to work together and all that sort of stuff. By 1948, the Soviet blockade of the city, I mean, that stuff's thrown out the window. You know, yeah. The Soviets have left the Commandantura. You know, they're not going to take part in the Allied Control Council. And yet, all of these things sort of carry over because suddenly... Actually, the renewed hostility means you can't deny Soviet soldiers access to Rudolf Hess. Yep. You can't deny Soviet soldiers access to the war memorial in the Tiergarten, which has been built, you know, 100 metres into the British zone. <laughs> Even after they put the wall up, you've still got to facilitate that access. 
the British end up in this strange situation where they have to guard the memorial from vandalism from local Germans, and all because they can't allow they can't allow the situation to deteriorate to the point where it might lead to war, which is a serious risk. But also the, all this propaganda value, they, they don't dare risk being presented as 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 the bad guys. You know, soldiers that they're they're both. They're both diplomats as well as soldiers, especially in Berlin. You know, there's, you know, I think, and one of my one of the uh, the the soldiers I quote there says, you know, it's the only place where you could accidentally start a war, pretty much. Yes, and, and you could be quite a low level individual in the grand scheme of things and get something wrong, and the consequences could be quite significant. Yeah, and alongside, the, but but as exactly as you say, alongside that, you have this ability to retain enormous fun. Um, the life in Berlin, despite this looming threat, despite the fact you were cut off, you know, the, the Allied Air, the, uh, the Berlin Brigade, um, blockade of 1948 had, had shown how easily the Soviets could lock, lock out Berlin if they wanted to and force the, the Allies into a fairly rapid effort, which whilst we celebrate that in the aftermath, it sails pretty close to the wind in terms of success and failure. Yeah. Yeah, they have a fantastic time. Yeah, it becomes this incredible place to be. And I think that says a lot about certainly British military culture of this era, that actually British soldiers want to be on the front line. They want to go to Berlin. They want to serve there. They want to look up close. They want to look through the fence of Gatow across the, across the way. Yeah. They want to poke their heads over the wall. They want to catch sight of the Soviets. They want to drive into East Berlin and see what life is like on the other side of the fence. But that must be quite different from some of the smaller postings because you write about some of the smaller bases, some of the, the Air Force bases, the um, places where there wasn't necessarily... Uh, no to nose of the Soviets or the East Germans, but it was a much quieter existence and, a, and probably a more German experience because of it. I would have thought. I think so, and I, I, I think certainly in certainly in Berlin, I think a contrast in Berlin is that the the, the, the people in West Berlin were always very grateful that the British were there and the yeah. Americans uh, as well because they were the bulwark against everything they could see and all the events of the you know the wall going up, for example, the the restriction on movement. It's very clear what would happen if the Allies weren't there. And, you know, the, the blockade, the Allied, you know, the Luftbrücke had, 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 was not just about supplying the, the garrisons in, 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 in West Berlin. It was about looking after the people of West Berlin as well. Mm. And that included flying people out who needed medical attention, all this sort of thing. That had brought the two groups really close together. Um, that crisis point, is never quite reached in the rest of the zone, at least not in the same period of time. You know, I think people, people in the West and in the Western occupied zones, the Germans do look at what happens. It's widely reported, and 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 say, well, okay, the Allies are here to protect us, but they still have a slightly begrudging <laughs> nature mm. about it. And yes, places like um, garrisons like Delmenhorst, um, very small town, not really a lot going on. Um, it's very difficult for people who do feel quite isolated there, in particular in the early decades when the British and the Germans are still leading very separate lives. The Germans are recovering and they're rebuilding. The British are there as occupiers until 1955 and then later as, as sort of allies as West Germany enters NATO, but they're very separate. And people don't have the language skills necessary to get out into the world. And those people find it very isolating and they find it very challenging. And that impacts upon soldiers. You know, if the soldier's family is unhappy in Germany, then he will be unhappy in Germany. Conversely, if the soldier and or his family are willing to break out of that and go somewhere else and travel and see this country in which they're living, they tend to be much more happier as well. And that's actually true across the decades. It's amazing how when you ask soldiers to reflect about their their, their time, uh, a soldier will look and, and, and they will say, well, actually, I, I loved Germany because of what it allowed me to do. And the people that took the opportunity are the people that are much happier and look back more fondly on it. Whereas the people that didn't, that, that were, for whatever reason, didn't get out of barracks. Mm. I find it very different. And, and realistically, they could have been, you know, they could have been serving anywhere. Um, and when you are far from, if you're stuck in barracks, but you're too far from home to, to get home, that makes it much worse. So when the family was out there and the third children, were the children educated by the military or were they educated in the German system? The, BEF, the, B, the, BE, the BFES schools. Uh, existed to educate school children and they're created very early on you know you've got um, Prince Rupert's school King Alfred's school uh, that they're there the, the two of the earliest but then schools are replicated in all the big garrison towns and, and they're established to educate under the British system 
uh, and they might have a British headmaster, but actually they tend to have German staff, which is quite interesting. And actually, it's teaching school. an English syllabus or yes, British syllabus. Teaching yeah. the British syllabus. And interestingly, what you'll see is 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 that it's sometimes the children who lead those ways of integration. Uh, King Alfred School is a wonderful example of this. King Alfred School up in Plön in in, in Schleswig-Holstein, um, right up there uh, in, in in the north of Germany. Um, they established themselves in an old naval training barracks and they have these wonderful facilities and you know i've spoken to former pupils of there and, and you know their their athletics teacher was a german athletics champion so he made them really good it was yeah. like being trained by an olympic athlete effectively uh, but they would compete against german schools as well again i think because they were german members of staff they were able to make those links so they would box against them they would play football against them they would sail against them all this sort of thing um they'd also hilarious Quite funny that they play basketball against an American school and be absolutely roundly thrashed, <laughs> yeah. uh, for example. But you know, th- th- I think this this sort of cultural richness that happened quite early on is is something that t- definitely took place. And lots of those children went on to join the army. Yes, uh, not and surprisingly, they had not, a good experience. Not surprisingly, they had a good experience. They went on to join the army, and they too went on to serve in Germany in later generations as well. And it's been wonderful in my research to both for the book, but also for the exhibitions, you find people that have seen Germany virtually in every single era, you know, people that went out there in the ruins of Germany in the aftermath of the war as children and then served as as soldiers there, uh, uh, either as ordinary soldiers, as officers, um, and then worked as civilians there in the aftermath. Um, you know, their their life experience is, the Ger- is German post-war history and the British Army is right at the forefront of that. What role did the British military play in the remilitarization of West Germany because that always is, seems a fascinating story in that you put down the coat of one army and you pick up the coat of another army in the same country that must have been a, a risk that they had to also manage internally oh certainly and it's interesting that you know many of the many of the leading members of, of, of that that nascent West German the Bundeswehr are former Wehrmacht um, who are you know and but pretty early on the 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 British and the Americans have been fairly pragmatic you know they've been consulting these people because these people know how to fight Russians if there's what you know if there's one they know they know how to fight Russians yes Uh, and so they've been consulted early on but actually this this move to have a an actual military is one that's greeted with a mixture of skepticism fear reluctance in Britain, certainly in Britain, you know, it, it, there are debates in the House about it, about whether this is right, about whether it can be trusted, but also in Germany itself. It's quite interesting. In West Germany, it's, there are a huge, Adenauer has to engage in a huge campaign of persuasion to get his own people to believe that militarization is 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 something that they should be but you doing. can understand that can't you, we, you know, how that that led them down a particular path led a nation down a particular path and they didn't want to go down that path again no absolutely and you, you know when you think about what some of the more radical and extreme plans were for germany in in the aftermath of the war you know there's talk about just flooding the mines destroying the factories yeah. rent, turn them into an agrarian state you can see year that, zero pop pop absolutely but one that's enforced by a foreign power, yes, uh, and kept in, and then kept in there in a foreign power. You you can absolutely see that, you know, there's there was been a reluctance from outside, but inside as well, definitely. And yet, there's also a recognition quite early on that actually, if the war it's going to come, and it's not just going to be a war, but it's going to be the war, particularly as the nuclear element takes effect. Yeah, the West Germans really, if we're going to be fighting in their country, they sort of they need to have a say in how that takes place, both as much as anything as an important source of manpower, the Soviet Union is very large, yep. the East German army is very large, uh, and it's, you know, it's much larger than what, certainly what Britain can put in the field against it, so an ally is always welcome. But also they are going to be fighting on their territory and on their land, and therefore they therefore need a say in, in what's going to happen, and the admittance of NATO, into NATO in 1955, uh, and the move from that is very much part of this shift in relationship certainly where you move from having gone from foe to protector now you're moving definitely into the realm of ally but your average british soldier and you this is another theme that you bring out very clearly is that he would have had predominantly he would have had a 
a lot of contact with Germans quite early on and then with Russians. You tell the story of a, a soldier working with a West German border guard. The border guard's sleeve rolls up and he sees the SS tattoo. You know, there's a wondering what he did uh, a few years previously and equally on the train and elsewhere and when the Soviets had the opportunity to come in and look at exercises that were going on there was a fair amount of contact that actually did go on at a person-to-person level. I think so definitely um, and increasingly between the, the British and the West Germans they spend a lot of time with the West Germans. Um, there's an exercise called April Fool that they run in sort of in, in the early 50s just before it's before they've really established the Bund- or established the Bundeswehr. And um, it's quite funny, you know, the British sort of are talking about logistics systems and they sort of point out that the British are the only people that have their, you know, all the continental armies use the same form of logistics, you know, use of measurements and this sort yeah. of stuff. And the British don't. And they tie themselves in knots about how they could ever possibly work with them. Uh, and it's quite interesting reading the comments and the notes about how they're going to have to bend and adapt to work with this new ally, let alone with the Belgians and the Dutch. Yeah. Uh, who are already there? Even the Luxembourgish are in, are in Germany for uh, for a, for a period of time until until the early fifties. So there is contact, and then there's the civilian, the human contact as well. You know, there are people who live in um, in requisition housing, where the person who owns that house lives just across the road or in a side room. And you know, Montgomery's rules about non fraternisation that he brings in very very early on because of his fear about a German resurgence, a mm. fear of a of, of just hiding away this militancy and then waiting for a chance to, to launch it again. He has some very strict rules on, on, on non-fraternization, extremely strict rules. And actually, uh, that causes real disquiet amongst the soldiers. You know, they're not allowed to talk, even, they're not even allowed to talk to children. Um, which when you think about the pitiful state that Germany's in in 1945 and then the really harsh winters that follow mm. the war in the immediate aftermath of it, it's really difficult. Those, are, those rules are quickly released mostly because they're seen as being unnecessary but also because they're just really impractical and they're not pragmatic because who do you think is running these messes who do you think is doing this stuff it's the germans who are doing it so actually the 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 british have been working with the germans virtually since since point zero string null really and for them you know moving into that and just having the germans in uniform is just the, the latest stage of that relationship and how quickly did the non fraternization start to disappear? Oh, it, it, it's debatable about whether it even existed at all, uh, actually. Um, I talk about Owen Smart in the book. Um, Owen was, he'd, he'd, been, he'd seen Belton, um, and then he moves down and he's in Paderborn, uh, and he, he is, he is, he's basically, his job is to find people houses. Hmm. He's assigned a German secretary to help him with his clerical work and they fall in love and then he asks if he can get married and his commander's officer says no. Um, and at first it's a real surprise to him. Um, and then he's posted somewhere else in a deliberate attempt to sort of break up this romance. Yeah. Fortunately, has a more sympathetic commander officer elsewhere uh, and he is able to get married and they, they live a very happy marriage for a very long time. But, you know, this... It, it just sort of shows how just... Inf- it, unevenly and infrequently this non fraternization rule was applied. For some people it is hard and rigid. Yes. And for others it's just it's as soon as it's read it's virtually dismissed. So when you were writing the book and doing your research, which stories did you find most surprising, most shocking, or that really uh, typified the whole British military experience in Germany? I think I love the stories of of sort of uh, cultural cultural interaction at these really fun levels um there's a uh, there was a guy with mac mcculloch who uh who did his national service uh in the royal tank regiment and um he is uh he's he's based up in uh, in Fallenbostel, uh and he tells this wonderful story about basically how he used to um just for a laugh for example they would when they drove through a german village they would get one of the, the dogs to poke his head out the top of the turret, complete with goggles and, and radio headset and that sort of thing, and they'd all button down the hatches and hide. <laughs> and for them, this was absolutely hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, obviously the Germans didn't really understand it. It wasn't, it was sort of this, this real point of difference in the sense of humour. Um, and likewise, you know, you, you, you hear the stories about, because the British insist on driving their own cars, uh, so, you know, right-hand drive cars and all this sort of thing, then later on 
the speed cameras, when speed cameras start coming and becoming a thing, the number of pictures of, you know, Labradors and that sort of stuff who get done for speeding down the autobahn because they're sat in the left-hand seat is, <laughs> is, 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 is hilarious as well. Uh, and, the, and the British just unwillingness to sort of do that, the, the, the preservation of their own sort of standards and views on things. Yes. Uh, has, has always been amusing me, but you know the sheer inventiveness of soldiers never never ceases to amaze me. Um, the type of things that you know get in trouble in Hamburg on the Reaper Barn and all this sort of stuff. The type of things that just ha- for decades soldiers got into various different scrapes and this sort of thing. But you know what? It's it was wonderful for for, for many people to, to to really just let people talk. I used to, when I was interviewing people, I'd just sit down with them. I'd just let them talk. Uh, and that was great. And you come with amazing things. Um, Rupert Smith told me this wonderful story about when uh, a, you know, when the thaw in the relationship is taking place between the two of them toward the end of the 80s, between the Russians and the and the Soviets and the and the, and the Western Allies and the British. You know, when um, Soviet observers used to come and, um, and view their exercises. You know, particularly in the aftermath of things like Able Archer, which had pushed things pretty close to the edge. Uh, he tells a story about a, a, a Soviet observer that comes to, to, to join him. I've got this exercise running as part of a, a divisional. I can't remember the exact construct, but there was more than my brigade on this exercise. It, 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 I was to be visited, um, and there was a sort of formula for this. You have a big tent, you get more coffee, it's about 10 o'clock in the morning, and you told them what you'd been doing the day before, what you, how it had gone, where you were going to go in the next 24 hours, and they could then choose where they'd like to go and look, and then the next day you'd repeat the process, and they could ask you questions about what they'd seen and so forth. Anyway, um, so I'm... <coughs> I'm, I'm the visited brigade throughout this exercise, so uh, 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 it's not the first time I've told them what's going on. And during this 24 hours period, um, the brigade was to cross the phaser. And we made a complete cock of it. it um, by, the, by dawn, um, I had the sort of brigade, the, the bridge had broken, there was uh, float, bits had floated off with t- tanks on it and it was somewhere downstream. I had a brigade split by a river with a bridge that what you know, no bridge to connect them up and so on and so forth. So I told them uh, what had been happening. Um, and say it's complete cock up and uh, you know that this next twenty four hours is he can watch me try to sort it out again and get everyone on the same bank. Um, and we couldn't do things because of the air threat and so forth, and I had to wait till dark. Anyway, I told them. And um, the, at the end of it, they're all having another coffee. And this Russian, um, um, I think he was what we would have called a brigadier. Um, and a East German officer came down and said to me, um, could we have a word? And I was sort of dragged off to the side of this tent, and the Russian said, to, to, said you really mustn't do this. You'll never get promoted. You should never give briefings like this. <laughs> And I was given this, you know, career uh, enhancing lecture <laughs> about <laughs> don't tell the truth and, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, anyway, um, uh, by 1991, um, uh, I'm a major general and standing in the staff college, um, giving, having been invited back to give a briefing on what we'd done in the Gulf. And in the audience were a whole load of Russians. And when it, uh, with their big hats and so forth, and when um, I finished, this same chap came bounding out of the crowd and said, ah, you took my advice. (laughs) That is a fantastic story. It's one of this, these these unique things about 
which and you know I've done a lot of work in the archives for this book, but unless you talk to the people who are actually there, you just don't get any of that. You know, yeah. none of that stuff ever makes it onto paper. Yes. And there's 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 hundreds of little stories and little things like that. Some of which were too uh, too, too risque to print in the book, actually, um, as you can probably imagine. Yes. Uh, what what military personnel get up to on their downtime? Uh, you know. The bath in uh, the bath in my sherry in uh, in Charlottenburg and all this sort of stuff has passed into legend. Yes, uh, and, uh, but th- th- but it should be recorded so it's not lost. Well, yeah, <laughs> um, I don't know if the participants might feel that way. Um, I always have a duty of care to some Indeed. people. Indeed. Uh, but you know, I, I think the the most enjoyable part of this has certainly just been listening to people talk, yeah. and I've always loved that. I mean, that's what I love about that's always what I've loved about history. Um, I actually. You know, I grew up listening to my granddad's stories about time in the war. Yep. Uh, and that's what set me down on this path that I could, was lucky enough to make this my career. So for me, the opportunity to talk to these people um, who and talk to them about both sort of the, the mundane domesticity of their lives in Germany at a time, but at the same time, these huge global events that were taking place around them. And it's amazing, really, because when we, when we think back on the Cold War, we, we, it's difficult to think back on it without the benefit of hindsight and knowing that, well, actually, the nuclear threat was so large and mutually assured destruction, no one was ever going to do it, you know. Um, but actually, for, for lots of people who were there at the time, it felt very real and it had to feel very real. And, and that was the way that people maintained the fighting edge and I think when we look back on the Cold War and particularly when we look back on the Cold War in Germany we need to look back at this is a this is a campaign that the British forces win you know deterrence is won by this ruthless professionalism and that comes about through having incredibly high standards in training and rigorous training continuous training that meant that the British were always ready to fight which then happens in 1990 in in the Gulf yeah and it's amazing really that you know that the the sort of the, 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 the valedictory lessons that come out of the British experience in Germany are fought, yes, fighting Russian kit, but Russian kit painted a sand colour in, yep. in the Persian Gulf. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's war, but in a different place, which is how I refer to it uh, in the book. And f- for many people, you know, it was, it was strange having spent their entire lives expecting to fight a campaign, you know, knowing exactly, literally knowing exactly where they would fight. Where they would stand and fight, um, you know that, that I think that had been the real training value of Germany. It had not, it had not been just been the scale, it had not just been the logistical things that came with practicing putting tanks on trains, which is a skill and needs to be practiced. It was the actual the the, the fact is that people were training to fight on the ground they were going to fight on and expected to fight on, and that is something that the British Army had never really, I don't think, had before. Uh, and certainly I don't think we'll have again. Right. And in terms of the, um, I mean, you asked a very interesting question, you know, how do you remember a war that was never a, a hot war? But I suppose that to a certain extent, the close to home threats, for example, the IRA uh, attacking British Army personnel in Germany must have made it feel very real at the same time, in a sort of threat, very asymmetrical threat, you've got a very symmetrical threat with the Soviet bloc. Yes, and I, you know, I spoke to all of my interviewees about about that about that period, the the, the ones that who'd lived through that. I mean, virtually all of them said, actually, you know, the biggest threat was the IRA because they were the ones actually bombing us. Yes. Whether it was the mortars into Osnabrück, whether it was the Rheindahlen bombing, um, the various there were there were a whole host of of attacks that didn't happen, um, let alone the, the, the sad murders of, of, of various personnel uh, across the years, the tragic murders. And for many people, this constant vigilance that created, that, that lack of a sense of security and safety was something that was very prevalent and people got very used to. And swiping mirrors under cars, for example, to check there was nothing attached underneath it. Um, varying people's routines, making sure your vehicle wasn't identifiable. All of these things became part and parcel of life in Germany in, in, in a way that um, the Soviets never really infiltrated into, despite the fact they were the main threat, despite the fact that's what the ar- that, that's who the army was supposedly gearing up to, yeah. right? 
Uh, and yet, of course, and at the same time, you have the, the various units of the British Army in Germany um, and, the, and the supporting air units as well being sucked out of Germany and, 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 and sent to Northern Ireland for, for, for four month emergency tours that sees you know, the armoured soldiers redeployed as infantry, artillery soldiers redeployed as infantry, either on the streets of of Belfast or in other urban areas or in, in you know, real bandit country in South Armagh. And, and it's sort of a... For a while, that it, it was sort of this, this transformation between training for soldiering and training for a war that never happened, and then this sort of operational duty that becomes real soldiering. And on top of that, you have something like the Falklands, which is real warfare, uh, and you, you have these different perspectives and levels of ideas about what actually soldiering is. Um, and as the years go on, I certainly, I certainly noticed in 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 my work and in my research, there is a trend where. Perhaps people become more sceptical about the idea about there being a, a nuclear war, a direct threat. And, you know, in particular, when, you know, someone like when Rupert Smith talks about it, you know, being visited by by Soviet officers mm. is, is part of that part of that way of de-escalating tensions and a thaw in the in the conflict. Um, and yet it's still very strange, isn't it? That you, you still are at a in a Cold War, at least. I guess it's institutionalized inertia. That actually, hopefully, that will mean that it doesn't go hot. Yeah, exactly. Um, and on top of that, again, you have all this the, the contact with the guys like Bricksmiths, which we haven't really talked about yet. Yes. Uh, these these guys who are really getting up close and personal uh, with with the with the Soviet bloc forces. And you you write in your book that Soxmith wasn't nearly as adventurous as the Allied military liaison missions. Not even all the Allied military liaison missions were that adventurous uh, by all accounts. Um, the Americans were, were were quite aggressive and would go out there. Uh, and in fact, it's one of the the Amer- one of the Americans is killed. Um, the British were very aggressive uh, yes. and very active in using it. Uh, the French not so much by all accounts. But the, no, the Soviets in in, in in back in the zone. Uh, with with Soxmiths, I think they were. M- most people seem to have. When most sightings of those I found about people were when they'd been in the Nafi in Bunda, uh, <laughs> stocking up on gin uh, or something like that, uh, rather than necessarily beetling around on the autobahns trying to uh, get a view of some of the big yeah. exercises that the, that the British were doing. There's a French film I've always tried to track down uh, the missions of Potsdam, the mission of the Potsdam, which talk about the French military as a mission, but I've never managed to actually get a get a copy of it but uh, you know, fascinating time when you know that the, the legislation allows them to do that and to get up close and personal and it's about how you interpret it when you're in the country and again it's one of these it's one of these hangovers from from when everyone was friends where because actually the british are under the command of group of soviet forces germany commander the Bricksmiths. The Bricksmiths guys yes. are. They, they are responsible to him and yet they are quite heavily clearly actively engaged in a form of legitimised espionage, if you will. Um, and it becomes this really exciting tour for people to be able to go and take part of. Um, and it has wonderful opportunities to to really be at the coalface and just do, to do this unique aspect of soldiering which can't be replicated elsewhere. And you have people who have served in, in, in Northern Ireland, perhaps with 14 uh, Intelligence Company or something like that. Um, but for most people, the Britsmith tour was you know, a real highlight of their experience in yes. the army. Um, because you, for these exact reasons, it's, it's, it's specialist, it's unique, it requires all these different complicated skills, you use equipment you don't otherwise use, and people go back again and again, and people try and rotate into it. So in 1989, the wall comes down, in 1990, East Germany ceases to exist, and yet here we are in 2019, and we're seeing the last of the British army withdrawing from Germany. That's a long period of time. How would the experience have changed without that Soviet threat there for members of the military serving there. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing, really, that, that the, the collapse, the unexpected collapse of the Soviet Union and the, and the, the general established communism, um, sort of ide- communist capitalist ideological divide, at least in Europe, is not understood, is not predicted by anybody, is not foreseen by anybody. And it results in a little bit of a crisis of identity uh, suddenly for the British army for the British forces suddenly yeah. this, this this place where you know this is what the British military was for this is why we were in Germany we were going to fight here yeah and then was, well, who are you going to fight yeah and why, and why are you going to stay here and there's huge cuts in options for change that come in they reduce the British army of the Rhine by half uh, 
uh, the RAF is rapidly removed completely. Uh, RAF Germany ceases to be its own independent command. Yeah. Uh, the squadrons are moved back um, to, 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 to mainland UK. And interestingly, if you compare uh, the RAF's experience with Germany with the armies, um, the army has a lot more... The, the 443 system that the army um, is able to operate on, which effectively gives them free reign over various parts of German territory, uh, some exceptions, but then they can compensate various landowners for and stuff like that. The RAF actually experience means that they have to, um, the, the reason they're given for relocating to the UK is it's easier to train at low levels over the UK than it is in Germany because the German people complain. Yeah. Which, when you think about how the army, the British military got there in 1945, you know, no one was complaining about low flying aircraft. And if yeah. they were, no, no one was listening. Yeah. Uh, and yet by, by the middle of the 1990s, there's, there is a huge sensitivity to what the Germans actually want. It's about being good neighbours yeah. as much as anything. And with the removal of the threat of the Soviets, absolutely, and that impending idea about this cataclysmic conflict, there is an idea about what, how much money is being put into this and the so-called peace dividend. Yes. Uh, and the peace dividend is not so not a dividend for the armed forces because it's really cut. Uh, in, in the aftermath of this and it does transform what Germany is to them the army remain and they hold on to it and they continue to use it as a as a unparalleled training area but they're steadily whistled away um, Rupert Smith in, himself is quite interesting you know, having successfully led the, uh, uh, the, the, the the British forces in the Gulf in 1991 you know for him it's amazing he says this to me and I quote it in the book he's amazed that they were still there afterwards um, but I think part of the reason they are is part of the reason of the reaction to the Germans. The, the, German, the Germans don't want the British to leave for, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, the, After 1990? Yeah, they don't want them to leave because economically they're incredibly important mm -hmm. to the local communities. But socially and culturally, they, they enrich the areas. The, 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 the transformation of that relationship um, of, of, of foe to protector to ally, to friend, has really taken place now. And actually, they're, they're, they're welcomed as neighbours and, and they're seen as being a positive effect on the local communities of these areas. And, um, you, you know, the, the, the reaction about people saying, uh, Rupert Smith quotes it, he says, you know, who's the, the, the local mayor of Verdun, when Rupert Smith tells him that the army are leaving Verdun, he says, well, who's, where are we going to find a band to play the shooting for? <laughs> We've always had a garrison, you know. We, you know a garrison that goes back to... Well before the British got there in 1945, a garrison that goes back, you know, to the time of Frederick the Great. Yeah. There's always been a garrison in Verdun. Did the, the British military presence in Germany ever hit mainstream culture? Was it, did it ever appear in, on television as a series or anything like that? I mean, it's it, you know, soldier, soldier. They're sort of out, uh, uh, they're out there as well and, 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 and do some time. And obviously they go off and do the Balkans as well, which sort mm. of marries up and matches up to that. Um, is it ever really massively in popular culture? I'm not sure. It's always there. People know it's there. Um, was it a given? Yeah. And I therefore, was slightly surprised when it went? Or I think it was. And in some ways, it's been one of the most frustrating things about trying to find and preserve some of that material culture. Because it's stuff that people just didn't keep because they thought it would last forever. Yes. Um, you know, people tell me, oh, well, we never went anywhere without a fuel map. British Forces Germany had tax-free petrol. So you could drive wherever they want and not pay tax on fuel. Fantastic. Wonderful <laughs> perk. So in the in the glove box of every car was a British Forces Germany route map, you know, it's like a standard road atlas, but also a British Forces Germany fuel map, which shows you all the petrol stations which you could get tax-free fuel using these special coupons you were given, and latterly a, a swipe card. One of those was incredibly difficult to find, incredibly difficult for me to track down and get. And then inevitably, when I got one, I then got off the two more, uh, because that's the way of these things. Yeah. But this stuff, just people just assume these things would last forever. And there would always be uh, British forces there, you know. Um, and that's from the German perspective as much as anything. Uh, you know, I, I, I spent some time with the German liaison officers who worked in the headquarters of British forces Germany. And they said exactly the same. We thought you'd be here forever. You're part of the fabric. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the guys I spoke to, uh, a guy called Jim, Jim Toms, wonderful man. Um, you know, he, he said something that really struck with me and that it's the, the soul of the British army was in Germany. And for absolutely for, for for certainly for 45 years in the Cold War and for 75 years to now, I think that's yeah. that's absolutely spot on. But you talk about the minutiae of 
the experience of being in Germany, which um, must be the hardest bit to track down, yet is the most accessible by those who will be coming to the exhibition in May next year. Absolutely. And for our exhibition, what we want that to be is we want it to be a celebration of the army's time. Um, Tinge with with nostalgia, um, the people will be thinking of certain characters who used to pop up on the training areas and and uh, and refresh the hungry soldiers. I mean, they'll be that that person will be featured quite heavily as well yeah. uh, in the exhibition, so no need to worry about that. But for people who don't know about this, um, and you know, there are the the British Army now is the smallest it's ever been, the smallest Senate, it's the smallest it's been since Cromwell's time. It's the smallest as a proportion of the population it's ever been. And so the people who are connected to this heritage and history, yes, it, it, it has tendrils out to people who were born in Germany or people whose parents served there or, 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 or that sort of thing, definitely. But there's a lot, vast number of people. We, we want to tell this story too. We want people to understand this, this, this vanished world that will never be... Rep- the British Army will never have a relationship with a foreign country like it has with Germany. Mm. The British forces will never have a relationship. Um, I talk about the army a lot, obviously, being a, 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 as a historian here at the, at the Army Museum. But the British forces will never have a relationship with a country like that again. Uh, as I said, you know, it, the only historical parallel will be somewhere like India. But even the relationship with India was incredibly different. Um, the level of familiarity and respect and friendship that existed between the British and Germany, and you've seen that in all the parades that have, that have marked this final year, mm. the presentation of the Fahnenbahns, um, the these streamers that are, I guess, the, well, the equivalency is freedom of the city, yep. that are handed out. You know, these are German people who welcome British military units and say, you can exercise your freedom of our town and march on our streets. I mean, this is a, this is a German people. You yes. know, with all their history of militarism and all the, you know, they welcome the British doing that. And I've been to these, and I've I've been very privileged to be invited as a guest to some of these, and I've seen and I've seen the way that the German people respond to them, and, and love that they love the pomp and the pageantry, and they wave the flags, and that type of thing won't exist anymore. And so, what we want our exhibition to really capture is the real the the, the story and this narrative about getting there as a, as 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 conquerors and occupiers in forty five to where they are now. And with everything happening in the big in the in, in the wider world about our relationship with Europe, it's, this is what the army's been able to achieve. Yes, and this is what the army continues to do in terms of cooperation with its European partners. And within that, we're going to have these touch points of these wonderful objects, these these things that really speak to that experience, that will be points of nostalgia for those who live them and understand them, but also real points of insight for those who are encountering them for the first time. So perhaps in May we can come back and uh, you can walk me through the exhibition and we can uh, tell our, our listeners all about it. Absolutely. It, it, what we'll definitely do is I'll, I'll walk you around the exhibition and we'll be able to, to, to look at some of these things in, re, in real detail when it when it's built. And, and yeah, absolutely, because it's going to be, I'm really excited about it. It's going to be fantastic. My colleague and I are, are spending a lot of time working on this. Um, the designers we've got working with us are trying to recreate this sense of, of place yes. and, and transform that and bring that out into the into the wider world for people to look at it and enjoy. And, and come May 2020, that's absolutely we are going to be the place to, to celebrate the British Army's time in Germany. So your book comes out on the 31st of October this year? Correct. The exhibition is in May next year? Absolutely. And in the time in between, there's going to be a lot of some quite exciting things happening in the museum here as well to really sort of tee up and keep this momentum building about this really important period of history. There must be a fair amount of video footage at that time. There is, there is. And, you know, it's actually been amazing to look through it. It's, it's, it's quite fun looking, looking back at it. Uh, you see something like Exercise Lionheart, largest exercise the British Army's ever participated in. Uh, in fact, large exercise the British forces have ever participated in. There's a really strong air element to that too with um, air, air combat and, and they simulate Spetsnaz attacks on, uh, yes. on, 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 on various air bases and that sort of thing in Germany. But there's 130,000 personnel involved in that which is an enormous number uh, when you think about it. And, and that rolling across the plane, that would have been an intimidating sight. And what we want to do is, is, cap- is use some of that and utilise some of that video footage as well. Fantastic. I think this book might be the first of many where I explored all these different things, all, all, all this stuff that I didn't quite get a chance to, to unpack in quite as much detail as I would have liked. But, uh, well, hopefully your listeners can join me on that journey as we move forward in the future as well. Thank you very much, Steve, for your time. No problem, uh, I look forward to talking to you again in May. Yeah, same here. Thanks a lot. Cheers, bye.
If you like what you are hearing, sign up to our email list at coldwarconversations.com. We have further photos and information on this episode, as well as a link to buy the book, which will directly help the podcast. The link will show in your podcast app. Don't forget, if you'd like to get the Cold War Conversations coaster and keep us on the air, head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate, or again, click on the link in your podcast app. And if you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group, where guests and listeners just like yourselves continue the Cold War conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. <laughs>